Appamata and its programs are supported by your generosity and your generosity and support makes such a difference. You can find a link for contributions on the website at appamata.org. Thank you. I loved a couple of things that Becky just said. We had um, practice discussion uh, with Peg, and one thing was um, she talked about her practice gang, and another thing is my life is falling together, and I hope I don't forget that, um, because we all know our lives falling apart sometimes. Um, the meaning of Sangha has really changed in this practice period for me. And where I saw it as a thing, now I see it as a number of really, really beautiful connections. And I saw that in the tea that I had with maybe about 30 people that I really um, felt was rich experiences for me. And um, especially something has happened in the last couple of days being here in the Zendo with Joan and um, Joel, and I've just never felt so supported um, in this, as I have with my wife for the last hundred days has um, been such a gem. And um, I think I owe her uh, lots of flowers or something. So I appreciate that so much. Um, I got a beautiful birthday present today from my son and his wife and kids. And what it was, well, in 1980, I took my, my son was six and I took him on a bus trip around the West and we went to museums and saw people and museum by museum. And our first one was Kansas City Art Institute. And um, he was very tired because we, we got on the bus at 12.01 um, at night so that we could get as many places and as much traveling done in two weeks because that's what you got for a hundred dollars then so uh at the st louis art museum which seemed like it was like eight in the morning or they opened very early he would sleep in each room and i would look at the art and then i'd wake him up and we'd take, go to the next room the next room so now he's 47 and he's been an artist and a professor of art um all his life anyway my birthday present from them was that they went as a family to the art museum for my birthday. And that just meant so much to me. That's been um, for my life, kind of my, my religion. And I had, uh, anyway, that's what I do. That's what I do. Um, there was a lot of darkness yesterday and so then I had um, like 54 pieces to look through and choose some from. And because of the darkness, I kept imagining Dalai Lama. He went into this hospital and he cried with each person. And then he came out and someone told a joke and he laughed at the joke. And I thought that was so important. And um, every night, I don't do this intentionally, but every night I can't go to sleep until I can get my wife to laugh. So we have all these make-believe animals in our room and you know, llamas and giraffes and alligators and some aren't you know, the friendliest animals. But anyway, we, we somehow laugh and that seems so important. And if we miss that, if we miss smiling and laughing, which is maybe why I picked the, the koan that I did. I, I got up this morning at um, 3, 3.31. And it was an auspicious time because um, there was a three and the one. And I've never been much a fan of numerology, but, but as I thought about this, the koan, I realized that there were three koans actually in it. And I'm going to tell you about two today. And then one when we, when during the, um, the exiting ceremony that we'll do later. Um, but one is obviously where uh, Buddha holds up a flower, that's one. Kashapa laughs, and then Buddha responds and says this, this thing about what the flower meant, that 
the Dharma really can't be spoken with words. So that's the three. And the two, I'm not going to tell you about the one, but the two is the Chinese version, Buddha holds flower, Kashapa smiles. That's the two. But this morning at 331, I, I thought of the one and that I'd missed the whole point um, of this. And um, since Maria is still is awake at that time, because it's much later, I wrote to her and I said, I figured it out. And she wrote back and she said, if you figured it out, you didn't. And I thought that was a beautiful response. Um, so what I figured out anyway, or what I didn't figure out, I'm going to talk about um, during the ceremony later. Um, and I just wanted to say that this has been the hardest and the most beautiful experience of my life the last hundred days, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do it. So I'm going to show you some um, pictures and text and Let's hope that they work. Okay, so give me some kind of signal that you see a full picture. Great, thank you, Maria. This is a Vulture Peak, where the Buddha sat and held up the flower. And uh, what struck me looking at the picture again yesterday was the number of flowers that he was surrounded by that people had given him as gifts. And it made me think too, I see Richie there. Richie, if you look in his background is all the beautiful art he made. And I'm so glad that Joel re responded to that. And a lot of the same colors as in Richie's art. But, uh, you know, here's a guy whose life was looking at suffering and trying to figure out how to end suffering. And he's, he's surrounded with all this beauty. I just, I just, can't get over that. And it was so important to me to find this photo because it made it a lot more real to me. Uh, I had stories before that didn't now don't make sense that that he was walking along and he picked up a flower. And in fact, Trouty has been there and said that there aren't flowers on the ground like that. They must have come from a, a little farther away. And I said, could 80,000 monks be here? And she said, no way. So that's something that we have to deal with in our imaginations. And here's Buddha holding up the flower. And it, it's so important, I've mentioned this before, I think that um, he's holding it with fingers and not with his hand. And fingers is like a real higher, more intentional act. Uh, and in some descriptions, he's twirling the flower. So he's showing all sides of the flower and all sides of the flower can either mean, you know, the different views, but it also means from the seed to dirt, that whole life of the flower. Buddha held up a flower. Sometimes it is depicted as a white lotus, but I like it better when it is a lotus with its roots dripping mud. That's who I was today when I led service and missed the robe chant. There were hopefully some moments where the beautiful end of the flower was revealed, but mud, the mud was there as well. The point is not to be a stone Buddha, nor to be a wild animal. It is the pure white lotus and the mud all in one bundle. That's why Kashapa smiled or not. And in some of the reflections, even today, I thought about that 
that aspect. Um, as we look at the pain and suffering, we need to also look at the, the beautiful flower that um, all of you are and that life is. Cousin Brian wrote, he held up all flowers everywhere. When I imagine those that know the story of Buddha holding up a flower, I can see all flowers being held up simultaneously throughout space and time. This kind of parallels with the idea that Buddha said on his enlightenment, I and all beings are now enlightened. Not on, only am I holding up a lotus, but so did those who preceded me, as did my children and their children, which my children are doing right now in the museum. Flowers filled the room, flowers filled outside the room, as far as Kashapa could see. There was nothing but flowers. I plan to show my progress in figuring out this koan. Peg corrected me saying, we don't really make progress. Rather, we illuminate jewels. This connects to Connie's way of walking through the woods. She doesn't walk to get any place. Rather, she walks to walk, to feel the earth under her feet, to see the trees in front of her, and to follow the clouds moving through the sky. Is that progress? Every day, Buddha holds up a flower. We have a line in one of our chants, life as it is, the only teacher, suggesting that Buddha is holding up a white flower at every moment. Just look anywhere. How do I respond? What do I say when someone tells me a dark, deep secret? How do I respond to the giant cockroach who has found its way to our kitchen? Am I so attached to my preferences that I feel nothing for her? Do I consider her life and her hunger? Do I appreciate that she was on the earth millenniums before I was? Can I gently rub her back? <coughs> the koan is from the thousand years ago, but really it is about this time being. Our cockroach is held by Buddha. She is a white flower. How might I respond? So at one time, my wife, um, Linda, uh, wrote a book about, uh, illustrated a book about Chris the cockroach. And so uh, cockroaches are been part of my life. Media, you've done a great job at describing the muddy water. This morning, however, as we sat in the cloud, I smiled at the beautiful flower portrayed in the 15 of us, including you sitting so peacefully in the cloud zendo. Out of the muck, beautiful things arise. That is what can warm our hearts and remind us, as Shelley wrote, if spring comes, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? Buddhist is, so each day as I sat, somehow the flower came into my head and I would wrestle with a certain facet of the koan. Buddha's decision to hold up a flower was entirely spontaneous, as was a brushstroke by Picasso or a note played by Pablo Casals. Buddha wasn't a newbie. He had paid his dues. For 500 lifetimes, he'd been the attendant for the previous Buddhas. He knew his way around the block. When Ananda stuck a blade of grass in the ground, Buddha saw that now there was a temple. There doesn't seem to be in Zen a correlation between time spent in deliberation and the quality of the action. Holding up the flower was a masterful stroke of genius, and yet it was a result of genuine flow rather than racking one discursive brain to come up with the perfect testing instrument. May what I do flow from me like a river, no forcing and no holding back the way it is with children. That's by Rilke. So this way I draw, uh, I don't want to talk too much about it, but it's been going on since the fifth grade in, you know, where I was supposed to be paying attention in school, I was writing, I was drawing pictures in the, on the edges of the paper. 
We have the expression that he's in his head, as I am so often. How is it that this koan has been alive for a thousand years? How is it that Kashipa, almost like a simpleton, smiles at a flower and gets a job for which others had yearned? How is it that the Buddha taught for 45 years and gave thousands of talks, yet by his own admission never said a word? How is it that sometimes I talk and talk and never say a word? Just ask my wife. Sorry, can't read it. Enough of this, Buddha said. I'm going to say something that won't be forgotten. And then he held up a flower. Oops. I noticed I was worrying and then I smiled. It was as if I had a new body. And please do that when you're worrying, when everything's so difficult, just smile and, and feel this rush of good stuff going through your body. I could feel different chemistry rushing around. I looked at the bowing mat by the altar and smiled as if it was a newborn baby. Then I saw and spoke to each of the Zafus waiting for our return to the Zendo. I kept smiling as I switched to gallery view and saw a grid of people each challenged by the trials and tribulations of their lives. As I smiled at them, I shared their pain. Bless them, I thought. And then I remembered Kashapa smiling at the flower. Perhaps he didn't know he was smiling. Perhaps he does nothing but smile, even in his sleep. Did the other monks even see his smile? but they must have heard the birds sing and the clouds dance when Kashiba's face lit up. It was such a simple smile, yet it was a smile that went around the world, not just 2,500 years ago, but every moment since then. This was not the smile that said to Buddha, cool move, dude. Rather, it was an affirmation of life, of beauty, of love. It was the whole story reflected in a faint smile. That's why Buddha chose Kashiva. Uh, in one of Linda's tea books, the, um, the, the author describes that someone brought Kashiva a basket of flowers and Kashiva picked one out of the basket. Even, the, even though I've been in school all my life, I detest training. The flower sermon could be a, seen as a treatise against training, or maybe it is just a training for the unexpected. Buddha comes to give a talk, but he sees 80,000 monks minus one drowning in the Dharma. And many, many of the koans, something I was thinking about, I think at 3.31 this morning, was how many of the koans have the same theme that and Peg mentioned it, I think, yesterday in our intensive that um, Zen is not about mastering the Dharma. And in many of the koans, uh, the Dharma is put aside. For example, the monk says, teach me about Zen. And the teacher says, have you had your breakfast? Well, then wash your bowl. You know, paying attention to what's needed in a moment is what this business is about. A basket of flowers is then given to him. What now is the appropriate response? Kashapa sees Buddha holding up the flower and immediately understands that this is the situation right now. He is not stuck like the rest of us in life as we want it to be. He simply responds to life as it is. This is the ultimate training. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and there's a flower kid. It looks kind of like devil, devil, um, whatever, symbols, and I'm sorry about that.
um, I should say something about that. That I don't take entire responsibility for my drawings. Um, they just kind of happen. That's the best way I can describe them. Um, and they always surprise me. And, um, you know, sometimes I felt like they come out of the pencil. I'm very special, you know, I feel a lot of attachment to my pencils. In fact, in these hundreds of days, I have about 10 pencils I'm using and I sharpen them all when I run out. And then, um, uh, anyway, they're getting too short. So I'm going to have to uh, go to a new group of pencils, which I'm kind of sad about because what happens to the drawings and the pencils that I'm not using, you yeah. know? Maybe I should bury them in the yard. She said I was a flower. I said, that's sweet. She said she didn't mean it like that. I said, that's a f I said that the flower is birth and life and death. She nodded. I hadn't considered being the flower. And one of the things we do in koan practice is we take each role. And sometimes there's roles that we don't even consider to be roles. I mean, like one time I decided, well, there's the onlooker to the koan. But, you know, even thinking of the flower as a role, because all this stuff is affecting um, everything within it. I was either the drowning monks or at rare moments, Kashapa. Never Buddha, wait until tomorrow's peace. There is that side of the flower where it is as it, is at its peak of beauty and vigor, but there is another side to the flower where it shines, emulating life itself, beautiful in its impermanence. As William Blake says, he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity sunrise. I am a flower, but not like the ones in the flower stores. I'm in their recycle bin to be made into fine dirt. I've just had this image of, uh, so if I were to do another piece right now, um, I had a German shepherd called Blackbeard and in, in college and afterwards, and, and uh, we'd go uh, in an alley behind a steakhouse, and I'd pick out steaks from the garbage can and uh, feed them to him. He, he just loved that. They would even be, still be warm. It says, look, Ma, no tears. Empathy versus compassion. We talked a little about that today. Tears and smile. If Kashapa had felt empathy for the poor and permanent flower, he would have had tears in his eyes. Instead, there was a compassionate smile. And I think Peg mentioned something about uh, with compassion comes joy. Maybe even an expression of sympathetic joy for you, Miss Flower at the height of your beauty, and as well, you get to become something or other over and over and over again for the rest of eternity. Yes, the smile was for you, Miss Flower, as you were held by Mr. Buddha. It was not silent when Buddha said, no words. Where I first got this idea was one of the rabbis talking about an early, I think the, the first or second temple and how this was like a community meeting place and there were smoke all around and there was a smell of burning uh, offerings. Um, there was incredible noise. So I'm, I'm trying to place myself in the situation. There were birds and monkeys and crickets and wind. And there were the grunts of 79,999 monks when he held up the flower. The difference was that the sound emulated from everywhere rather than somewhere. It was in fact noisy, noisy that is, until Kashapa smiled. At that you could hear a, I'm sorry, yes. At that you could hear a pin drop, an electrical encounter occurred between Buddha and Kashapa, just like when Ben Franklin flew his kite on that stormy night. Yeah, this looks a little bit like a diaper or something. I, yeah. 
think my wife might have commented on that. It's not. And that's a, a rakasu, which is made of little pieces of, of uh, old pieces of cloth. In what might be the most important part of the Diamond Sutra, Buddha puts on his patch robe, picks up his bowl, heads for the capital, begs for alms, eats his rice, puts his bowl and roll away, robe away, washes his feet, sits down on his seat, crosses his legs, adjusts his body, and then turns his awareness to what is in front of him. So that's the form we do when we come in the room in the Zendo. In my mind, it is then that one of the 80,000 monks brings to him a basket of flowers. He looks out, sees that many are drowning in the Dharma, picks up one of the flowers with his fingers and holds it up. And remember, he's holding it up with his fingers, not with his hand, and he's twirling it. I love that idea. He's twirling it around. And Kashapa smiles. One simple act followed another. Each simple act is the appropriate response to what preceded it. The hermit in the hut doesn't respond to the sexy granddaughter. This is another koan. The old woman throws him out and burns his hut down. The monks don't respond to the beautiful flower. They don't become Buddha's successor. How is a Buddhist to behave in the face of the intoxicating beauty of a ripe flower? Do they reply as the hermit did? An old tree on a cold cliff, midwinter, no warmth. Um, Christoph suggested to me once to use less words, and I also found that uh, reading so many words and giving Dharma talks was uh, a little boring. So, so my new thing was to do four lines in notes. I just said, if I can't say it in four lines, it's not worth saying. So. Uh, the, now I'm starting the new, newer ones. We must make one mistake after another. Buddha made mistakes before his enlightenment, like following false teachers. Later, he didn't describe which of the rules should be followed after his passing and which should be avoided. And he repeatedly denied women from being ordained until he finally did. Yet, with complete confidence, he held up a flower so Kashapa would smile. I thought about the 12,000 pages of monastic codes that I have, no longer needed at one Zen temple because they had another copy. Did the monks make a mistake by not smiling? Did the hermit in the hut make a mistake by not warming up to the beautiful woman? There was Pardon My Bloopers on TV years ago. At least then we learn to laugh at mistakes. When Dalai Lama washed the feet of the homeless, there was not a thought that this is unpleasant. Well, I'm hoping that there wasn't. Rather, it was an act filled with compassion and love. It was connection between two human beings. You know, right at this moment, it seems like he, he might very well have thought of this as a privilege to be able to do this, or, or when the Pope does that. One often seen as divine and the other is dirty. Oh, it was a connection between two human beings, one often seen as divine and the other is dirty. In the flower sermon, Buddha doesn't transmit Kashapa. Rather, a similar equal connection occurs, again, by people of different rank. How do I respond to this opportunity to care? Even asking this question wastes time, but not asking can be dangerous. My story today is that Buddha looked out at the monks and saw that more words would be like tying weights to one drowning. As Mr. B held up the flower saying, whoa, horsey, you need to stop and listen. Listen to the sound of one hand clapping. And Mr. K smiled. So here you see the Dharma full being weighed down in the water with 200 pound weights.
Basho had acquired Kurumi or lightness and artistic spontaneity, which is the fruit of a lifetime of poetic cultivation. Basho it was in the 17th century, uh, the, probably the most famous haiku writer. Buddha had this lightness when he held up the flower and Kashapa smiling as a recognition of that lightness or even humor came from that same boundless place. There was an element of play here in the best sense of the word, even in Blake's organized innocence. And, and the beach ball is really important. Um, I had a philosophy teacher who talked about how we can't control our lives and uh, but our lives are just like a beach ball floating in the ocean and what we can do is we can just tap the beach ball a little bit from side to side. Uh, and then also the upside down man. Um, there was a theater group called something about the upside down man and then there's a painter and all his figures are upside down. So, um, you know, I could go on and on about like the different references and where I've stolen all these ideas, like the, the, the Zafu there that he's sitting on is like a target, it's like concentric circles. And I had an, uh, 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 I guess an argument with a, a painter once about um, concentric circles and how they were targets and they were loaded and you couldn't ever get away from them that they were like targets and this was at the time of Martin Luther King um, being shot and then I did a, a print about that. Uh, anyway, so this stuff comes from um, a long time, I guess. Oh, Buddha sat on Vulture Peak, barely visible to the half mile, half mile of seated monks who couldn't clearly see him holding a flower nor hear him declare. It does not rely on letters and is transmitting outside the scriptures. I now pass it on. The story is beyond our imagination. Reducing it to a case of cause and effect is a sacrilege. It was silent and deafening. So I kind of calculated uh, how much space 80,000 monks would, would um, take up. And this number times 2,666.66667 2, is 80,000. When one's friend loses a loved one, there is nothing we can say. The silence of the Buddha when he held up the flower was the silence of that elk. Here was the most perfect of all beings tragically struck down after a very short life. Kashyapa's smile was not one of joy, nor was it one of sadness. It was an acknowledgement that the impermanence of life as it is, is always we've got, and that's okay. So you can look at the flower Oh, it's so beautiful. Or you can look at it and saying, oh, this is so sad because it's going to die. Or you can uh, just embrace the whole process, which I, I take the, sm the smile as. In the Jewish Shema, we hear that we are to love with all our heart. Buddha's sidekick Ananda posited that sp spiritual friendship was half of the Dharma. No, said Buddha, it is the whole bit. So it is with the flower. It isn't different from the Dharma, but rather it is the whole Dharma, expressed succinctly and completely without any words. Someone once said today that form contradicted emptiness. No, I said they are one. The flower is one with the Dharma, so subtle that it needs no words, just like love. And D equals F is Dharma equals flower there on his t-shirt. When Mensa, that's the uh, word I have for my wife, though she says she's not a Mensa. When Mensa said, I like the drawing, I read that as she didn't like the text. I asked her why. She said it was too complicated. 
<laughs> this makes me remember um, an, a part of the uh, one of the uh, friend who was in the, on the engineering faculty came to an exhibit of my work, and he said, "Oh, those frames are really, really nice. Did you cut all those mats, or something like that?" She said that it was too complicated and that a flower is just a flower. What else might be ordinary? In Buddha, is Buddha just an ordinary man? For he said, I and all beings are enlightened. Was Kashava just a regular guy as well? Maybe it was his ordinary being that could simply smile at a flower. While I worked on the drawing, Mensa was planting flowers in our garden. Who was the Bodhisattva today? I asked Mensa if holding up a flower was like breathing in and Kashapa smiling at a flower was like breathing out. She said, no, the other way around. Her argument was that you smell when you breathe in, which Kashapa did before he smiled. Striking out again and then sitting this morning, I was struck by how far Buddha went out on a limb at Vulture Peak when he held up the flower and how Kashapa connected so intimately with him when he shot Buddha that smile. Warm hand to warm hand. I was so wrong in projecting what I saw when Buddha looked out onto the monks. These were his children that he loved unconditionally, and they were his hope for the continuation of the Dharma. They were not drowning in the Dharma, nor were they swimming like fishes in the ocean. You know, and today we were talking about practice and what it meant more like the doctor's practice and practicing to get good and these monks were not good or bad they were just where they were and one of the there there were two themes that came through in all the teas that i had with people and one was people were always questioning you know how's my practice or my practice isn't good enough and the second was that uh, that we've all had terribly hard lives. And that just came through over and over and over again. And, and um, was an eye opener to my, me. They were simply who and where they were. Though Buddha said he had never said a word, he kept on teaching for much had to be spoken before one like Kashava could spot could light up upon seeing a flower. So it, it's really odd that this this thing we do that has so much silence to it and so is so nonverbal. You know, there's so many millions of books written about it. And there there's a book called You Have to Say Something. Which, by the way, um, I checked out from a library, and the only other person who had ever checked out that book from the library was one of our entrusted teachers. It was nice to see his name there. There must have been a period of waiting before he held up the flower. The timing was critical. So this might be what preoccupied my my sitting period is is trying to to be there and and you know with that time sequence of of uh, first the silence like once um, I went to a lecture by John Cage and someone asked him a question and he said I haven't thought about that and then he was silent for what seemed like forever and then he came up with the answer it's that timing that not that it was forced, it would have been, I think, really natural in this thing, but but also critical. And if you, um, you know, have done any acting, you know how important timing is. Uh, sometimes people are just like, almost like fast ping pong game, they're, they're going back and forth. And sometimes there's long, long, long pauses until you get uncomfortable. One could hear a pin drop as they waited for the Dharma to be spoken. The memory banks were open and shelves were cleared for new words. You know, they didn't have the benefit that we have of recording, so they had to remember everything they heard. Anticipation was so thick that speech would have knocked the leaves off the trees. 
And then silence was broken with the display of the flower, an equanimous being with no preferences. And some, some don't agree with that. They think flowers have feelings. And if you put words on the side of bottles, they, nice words, they grow better. And so I don't, that's another matter. Um, I'm so angry I could kill him. Then we hopefully see the one who is angry. We start to see the other as a precious human being and say to ourselves, God love them, or as we forgive our trespassers. In the flower sermon, the other monks missed the boats. Their expectation, so it's not like they, uh, they were okay with it immediately. Their expectation got the best of them. How long would they have held on to not being chosen? Could they follow that first thought of disappointment with the question, when is the next boat? That's the test of our practice. So we're going to feel afraid and we're going to feel angry and we're going to feel sad. And it might be for five minutes or it might be for the rest of our lives. Two women have babies on the same day. One is stillborn, both claim the live one. That's wisdom in a sense, finding a clever solution to a difficult problem. The women go to, so their first clever solution was both of them claiming the live baby. And not that clever, but you know, it, it was better than having a baby who wasn't live. The women go to King Solomon. He asks that the baby be cut in half. So that's another level of wiseness. The real mother's love takes over and relinquishes her live baby. King S is exhibiting wisdom beyond wisdom. And I'm not sure of that anymore. I think there's still uh, ways to go. Touching the heart and body of the real mother. Unlike the wisdom dharma, the flower that Buddha holds up touches the heart and soul of Kashapa. A heartfelt smile ensues. Neither Buddha nor the flower, nor Kashapa smoke, spoke. The flower had no own being, meaning that the flower did not generate itself or have essence. There are the three silences of the flower sermon. The Buddha said no words, the flower had no own being, and Kashapa smiled. Dissecting a flower, one initially finds only parts. Dissecting the parts, there are just particles of dust. And these particles are almost all space. No essence, no words, only transformation. Still another mute. So this is three mutants. The War Department paid Langley $50,000 to invent the first airplane. His crew had engineering training, believing that flying was a question of power, as the 80,000 monks had faith in the power of their Dharma knowledge. The Wright brothers had no such training. They worked in a bike shop where unstable vehicles needed balance, the middle way, equanimity, not being caught by preferences. The flower was a contest between learned, powerful monks and a balanced Kashapa acting without the shackles of the Dharma. So uh, the Orville here, Orville Wright is saying balance and and Langley saying power. And it wasn't until 1948 that the Smithsonian um, actually acknowledged that it was the Wright brothers who had the first airplane because uh, the government had spent so much money on supporting Langley to do this invention that they, they faked it. His humili humiliation and false accusation is that same flower that the Buddha held up. We say that if you want to find a teacher, choose the person who gives you the most trouble. This person is your flower. At soccer camp, everyone gets awards. Those aren't flowers. They're just non-awards that teach us nothing. Buddha's flower was a kind teaching for the monks. Given the speed at, speech, given the speed at which Kashapa reacted with a smile, I assume he recognizes generous and perfect teaching. The Dharma is not the Dharma. The flower is the Dharma this time. And that's maybe a difference between 
Zen, Zen and Theravadan Buddhism is what really is the Dharma? Is it the experience of our life or is it the book? And in uh, Judaism, it's the same thing. What's the Torah? Is it, is it these specific words or is it a life well led? Emptiness may be all of Buddhism, believing that things arise on their own, that they don't change, and that they have a permanent essence causes our suffering. The flower embodies emptiness. It comes from a seed. It comes from another flower. It changes with the blink of an eye. And whatever, whatever is its essence now is not what it was or what it will be. Are we any different than the flower except that we often reside in our delusions, believing that we are more than five skandhas, form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. Kashyapa's smile is his comfort with just this. The flower is just what it is, as are we, nothing more than our skandhas, also called heaps. This is an illustration I found um, with an eye in the hand. And it's really evident with the fingers that the flower is being um, turned. I like that too. A friend wrote today that the Bible was true and another wrote that the flower sermon never happened. Neither of these assertions matter to me. These myths are our histories. They help construct who we are. All the Bible stories and the koans replicate our own experiences. For example, we're all, we've all known people who are so much in their heads, like me, that we just want to tell them to shut up and enjoy the flowers. We all experience the biblical stories, well-meaning folks caught red-handed by greed, hatred, and delusion. Did it really matter? Did it really happen? It could have, and that's what really matters. Art professor Minerva cried when she looked at a Renaissance painting. Reggie went ape when she viewed a beautiful flower. Dongshan said, just as though the entire earth was spewing flame. Kashiba's smile was not a discursive acknowledgement that the Dharma can't be expressed with words, that it cannot be figured out, that it can only be embodied. It was like when the earth was first formed as a molten mass where there were only flames. William Blake chose the lion over the lamb, hell over heaven. Kashiva's smile was that of proud parents when they first see their newborn. There was no discursive experiencer, just the experience so overwhelming that there was no containment, no barriers, only boundless love. Then I came upon the title for our book of koans, The Gateless Barrier, also known as The Gateless Gate. Ruminating about the title, I wondered whether The Gateless Barrier was like my nightmare room without a door. Ruminating a little more, I remembered that I had been inside one of Richard Serra's enclosures and also many times saw a similar flat panel of his at the St. Louis Art Museum. I kind of understated this. It was like maybe three or four years between having this kind of uh, image in my mind and realize it came from this Richard Serra sculpture. I didn't realize how affected I was. Even though there were spaces between the panels, I'm feeling imprisoned by these steel wool walls. It would seem easy enough for one to come and go through the openings between the panels but the panels were so oppressive, I could not do that. And here you can see Richard Serra's sculpture, which I didn't think affected me as it did so much when I saw it. And there, there were uh, plastic uh, uh, flamingos. The time I saw it, there were plastic fl flamingos all in the yard there. It was, I don't know, Flamingo Day or something. It was crazy. The silence of Sarah's installation is like the silence of Buddha twirling the flower in his fingers. Sarah wasn't whispering. It was more a severe silence, not unlike Rothko's silence in the Rothko Chapel, 
where he reduces his language to soft, dark rectangles. But Sarah is hard without visible emotion, while Rothko is playing classical music. Where are the doors to these artworks? What is confining me? Why, with all the openings between Sarah's panels, do I feel so confined? In a review of two koan books, an author writes, each koan marks a checkpoint, a boundary that exists in the imagination. It can be crossed time and again, and with each crossing, the perception is deep, deepened. And here's another image of the, uh, the panels. She asked what is next after being head student. I said that I'd be the tail student. In the koan we just studied, Wuzu says, it is like a water buffalo passing through a window frame. Its horns and hooves have all passed through. Why can't the tail pass through? Sometimes we call this closure, leaving a job or place, or getting that last part of you through the window, but actually it points to something else. In the exit ceremony, I'll say, though a mosquito biting an iron bull, I cannot give it away. There is always a tale that follows you around. It is the unfinished details. I lock the temple door, but then I check it two times, and still I wonder if the lights are off and have I left no trace. That's the tale. It is a seemingly simple job to pass the smallest part of you through the window, yet sometimes it just doesn't want to go, not yet. Guo Gu gave this koan to his four-year-old daughter. We're almost done, we're almost done. A duck is in a bottle. The opening is much smaller than the duck. How do you free the duck? At first, you might think this is an unlikely story. That is until you look in a mirror and see that you are not free. Buddha's 80,000 disciples are in this bottle. That makes them disciples and not Buddhas. To the extent that all the teachings have been fed to them, they have heard it all, yet they are not free like Kashapa is, able to smile at a twirling flower. The duck could bang its head against the side of the jar, or it could simply reside in life as it is and celebrate its freedom inside the jar. It is that simple. We suffer because we think there is no escape. And there is no escape because there's no place to go. We are already there. And here too. And if this isn't enough, yesterday I wrote, over the last three months I've had numerous practice edges with this koan. Each one was a hurdle to embrace and to finally set aside. Friday I had a major disagreement with Buddha. I asked him why he broke the silence with his explanation of why he picked Kashapa. I thought it ruined his performance. This wasn't just a disagreement with Buddha, but also with my father when I disagreed with things that he did. And like my father, Buddha never was affected by my disagreeing. He sat there like a stone, not even having to entertain the thought, this too will pass. We have a few minutes for questions. But remember in the ceremony, I'm going to actually conclude this trip with the flower. Though Maria says it's impossible. So I'm going to go to a gallery view. And Ellen, with the long hair, who's still muted, okay. Um, what is the cat in your drawings? I just keep looking at that cat, and I've never heard you say anything about the cat. 
The dog. Oh, the dog. What's the dog? Well, it, the dog is actually a pig. <laughs> and um, I hate to admit this, but uh, well, I've loved pigs because the, the, the things coming out of the pig's mouth are, I used to smoke. And I think Linda might have started the thing fire mouth, but maybe I did, but that was his name. And in undergraduate school, I did paintings of this pig, but then I made the legs longer and that became a dog. And then also speech has been so important to me that I've talked about. And so those things, the smoke coming out of the mouth is also words. So, but n not too much cat. Well, so there might be a particular drawing, but I, not a lot of drawings. What's the significance? Why do you put it in these drawings about the flower? Any particular reason or you just like it? Oh, I think kind of a witness. Oh. And, and, you know, again, but it's like what the process is like, there's a saying I like, which is the artist is not the best expert on their work. You know, do we really know why we do things? I mean, I, I can tell after the fact, but, but, oh, I have, I do have a rule making art and that is whenever I have an idea to do something, I do it. I mean, it's kind of my rule of life, I guess. So it's sort of spontaneous, the pig. Yeah. Yeah. The thought comes in my head. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a little pet here? Thank have you. someone looking on, you know, I'm not, um, comfortable in my own art with uh, leaving space, leaving things empty. I'm working toward that, but probably not in this lifetime. Anyone else? Hey. So I'm wondering, how long does it usually take you to do one of your drawings? Oh, the drawings. Um, oh, so I'd say between one and two hours, maybe. Uh, a number of them, I would do a simple line drawing and then take it in the computer and do stuff. And that was actually faster than doing the entire thing with pencil. Uh, and then uh, I, I did the writing usually in the morning and the drawing at night. So you, you knew then what you were going to be um, moving towards when you did the writing, you had, it was them working all day in you, and then you would do something, you would do the drawing at night? I wrote right after Zazen a lot of times. Uh huh. Because I, if I don't do that, then I forget. <laughs> and then, uh, but it's, I guess having the, the concept sitting with me during the day, uh, the drawing would just come out very quickly. They're so uh, fresh and spontaneous, the drawings. Yeah, and what I'm going to uh, talk about in, when I talk about the koan is um, this kind of disparity between my drawings and my discursive mind mm -hmm. you know, that I'm very aware of. And I'll just tell you guys now. So I told Linda that last night. She said, don't talk so much or something. <laughs> I don't think it's so much a disparity as um, you can see these are facets, different facets of, this, of the mind that get expressed in these ways. I, um, I really like math and I really like um, mechanical things and building and then I really like uh, art. They're, they're almost opposites. But here you have found a way to bring them together. Yeah. 
and they, and they um, complement each other. So one of them without the other would be incomplete, right? Well, I'm looking forward to going back to just doing pictures. <laughs> For a while, uh, but quite an exploration of the colon. But don't give me another one. No more colons. <laughs> oh wait, you picked that one. Oh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the way the reason I picked it was uh, when I was with my sister who was passing away. I went to a, a junk store, and there was a book by. Uh, uh, can't think of his name, but anyway, on koans, and this was um, one of the koans in that book, so I kind of associated with that. But also the flower um, is just so needed, especially in this time that we've had this, yeah. this smile, the laughter, the jokes. Um, we're coming out of a pretty severe time, you know, between the political climate, the climate, climate, the uh, pandemic, unbelievable stuff that we've all been going through and then individually you know as I look out I see each one of you is going through something yeah. as severe that would be enough in itself without these other three things that's right that's right so I really appreciate all of you in the last hundred days and before <laughs> This has been quite a year. Most of you have been, I think you've all been here for the year and um, we'll never forget it. Thank you. <laughs>